Our thanks go to Undersecretary General Ryder for his uh, opening remarks. I would now like uh, to provide some additional uh, context uh, from uh, our, the UNIDIR uh, perspective, and perhaps the best way to start uh, is to also quoting from the Secretary General's policy brief that would, was issued earlier in May this year, and to which uh, the Under Secretary General already referred. So I'll start with a quote. A major risk to outer space security is its emergence as a possible domain of military confrontation between major military powers. The combination of new space actors, the proliferation of space objects, and the fact that many space-based services have both military and civil users, and the increasing reliance of armed forces on space systems exacerbates this risk. Now, as we know, the existing space governance architecture has made a very valuable contribution to the safety, the security, the sustainability of outer space. But we also know, and certainly at UNIDEA, we feel that further work to develop the system, to adapt it to the challenges of the 21st century, uh, is now needed. And in this regard, multinational efforts to enhance space security, to enhance uh, space security frameworks and regimes, have encountered a number of challenges, in part, of course, due to disagreements born out of geopolitical tensions. This has led to concerns over future multilateral space security discussions and how far they can go. Such concerns, unfortunately, are valid in the current context. Clearly, we've seen a vast and accelerated erosion, if not disintegration, of many fundamental arms control and disarmament regimes in recent years. Nevertheless, as far as the space security debate is concerned, space governance uh, is, is concerned, we do see some grounds for cautious, cautious optimism. As the Under Secretary General just pointed out, we've seen agreement by the United Nations Disarmament Commission on recommendations to promote the practical implementation of transparency and confidence building measures in outer space activities with the goal of preventing an arms race in outer space. We also see states continuing to indicate their commitment not to test direct, ascent, destructive anti-satellite missiles, or not to be the first to place weapons in outer space. The open-ended working group may not have reached a, a report, may not have been able to agree on a report, but it nonetheless, of course, enabled an important open and inclusive discussion on existing international legal and other normative frameworks related to outer space security, it also provided an opportunity for constructive exchange around current and future threats by states to state space systems. And furthermore, the open-ended working group process has also served to highlight points of convergence among states, as well as a willingness to work towards crafting solutions for space security. Now, this willingness to continue working towards solutions hopefully will also inform the upcoming group of governmental experts on further practical measures for POWERS approaches. Now, in parallel with all these multilateral processes, we can also see the ongoing development of domestic policies and legal frameworks to address space security concerns. The UNIDIR space security portal in this regard demonstrates that there is a diverse toolbox of domestic measures being developed around the world in pursuit of increased space stability and sustainability. From the odd 20 country profiles that the UNIDIR team so far has completed in the space security portal, to date we've identified more than 700 relevant national documents covering a range of issues and measures in the various countries uh, under uh, exploration here. Further, we see a range of initiatives emerging from civil society and the private sector and some of which uh, I'm delighted to say will be discussed over the course of the next two days. And these practical tools and approaches to building space security, safety, and sustainability can clearly complement and support multilateral processes. We've also seen an increased participation of industry actors and communities from emerging and future spacefaring countries in national and international uh, related dialogues and debates. And clearly, this contributes to making space security a truly global effort. Now, this is important because our modern way of life is increasingly dependent upon space systems, as everyone in the room, I'm sure, is keenly aware. Space technologies can help educate, feed, alert, and protect us, especially in the face of climate change. In short, they help us to address global challenges 
and to implement the Sustainable Development Goals. Now, when we discuss these challenges in at UNIDIR, given our mission and mandate, we often do, it's important to recognize the numerous opportunities that space technologies also present. And it's important to stress that these opportunities can only be harnessed in a safe, secure, and stable space environment. The challenges and the opportunities are intricately interlinked and interconnected. As states and other stakeholders continue working to address space security issues, UNIDIR stands ready to support your endeavors. Last year, we established a dedicated space security program at UNIDIR to work on enhancing space security and achieving a more peaceful, secure, and stable world through three strands of activity. Facilitating informed policy making, and uh, our Outer Space flagship conference is certainly part of that endeavor. Fostering collaborative governance and common understanding, and providing thought leadership on areas including the role and limits of norms, the intersection between space and gender, space and other technology relationships, as well as definitional and conceptual work on key terms and concepts such as dual use uh, and dual use purpose. We've been very busy over the past 12 months providing support to the open-ended working group, organizing regional events in Africa, South and Central America and Asia, providing new thinking on norms and verification monitoring, for example, exploring the potential of space situational awareness as a tool for verification of future agreements, and developing and building digital products such as the Space Security Portal and the recently published Lexicon for Outer Space Security. Looking further to the future, we at UNIDIA recognize that space security concerns are not static. Clearly, the contrary is true. They're dynamic and increasingly complex as space-related technologies advance. The participation of the private sector continues to grow and space missions continue to evolve. We very much hope that this conference provides an opportunity to bring together the diverse space security community in an informal setting to jointly consider issues related to space security. And we clearly hope the discussions to be held over the next two days will serve as a useful platform to develop a system of measures to deal with today's space security challenges. Now, before I conclude, let me say that uh, the Outer Space Conference 2023, like all our activities at UNIDIR, would not be possible without the financial support from the governments of the People's Republic of China, <coughs> Norway, the Holy See, the Russian Federation, and the United States of America, as well as the Secure World Foundation. I would like to take this opportunity to express my sincere thanks to all of them for helping us to make this conference happen. I also and equally want to thank everyone working behind the scenes who uh, has worked tirelessly to make this event possible. From the side of UNIDIR, Letizia, Sarah, Xingwei, Jamie, and Almu, and I also would like to thank Peter, Victoria, and Brian from the Secure World Foundation. Thank you all, and once again, for joining us at this event. I very much look forward to fruitful and hopefully engaging and constructive discussions, and I wish you every success over the course of the next two days. Thank you all very much. So my name is Sarah Erickson, and I will be the moderator for panel one which is mapping space threats, risks, and challenges. So we all know that space-related technologies are advancing around the globe. And with that, it creates significant opportunities to address societal challenges. However, these technologies can also be employed for hostile purposes. And so this first session will provide an overview of the value of space assets for development and present different perspectives of threats, risks, and challenges to space security. So we have an excellent lineup for you all today, and if you'll allow me to introduce briefly our first panel. So we have with us virtually Brian Whedon, who is the Director of Program Planning for Secure World Foundation and has more than 20 years of professional experience in space operations and policy. Brian is a member and former chair of the World Economic Forum's Council and the Future of Space Technologies, and also the former executive director of the Consortium for Execution of Rendezvous and Servicing Operations, or CONFERS. 
we have um, Andrei Shabalin, who is counselor of the disarmament team at the Russian mission to the UN in Geneva. He graduated from the Military Academy of Strategic Missile Forces and the Diplomatic Academy in Moscow, and has been involved in arms control, disarmament, and non-proliferation since 2000 when he started his diplomatic career at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and has been serving in his current role since 2019. We have Rania Tukubri, who is an aerospace engineer working on the design, integration, and verification of spacecrafts. She is a project manager at Airbus Defense and Space and a PhD candidate on the new generation of onboard computer for lunar missions within University of Lubeck. And we have Joanne Wheeler, who is a leading expert in the field of satellite and space law, policy, regulation, space sustainability, spectrum and commercial contracts, having worked at the UK's Ofcom, the European Space Agency, and has over 20 years in private legal practice in this area. She is the director of the Earth and Space Sustainability Initiative, which is working to develop and publish practical industry-led space sustainability standards by taking a holistic approach, and is also managing partner at Alden Legal. So now I will pass it over to our panelists to begin with their sharing their general views on this topic. And if we are all set, we can begin with our uh, virtual panelist, Brian. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to participate in this session. Uh, as far as, uh, and I'll keep my opening remarks very short because you know, there's probably a lot of discussion we want to get to. <clears throat> I see the current situation when it comes to space security as uh, having both positives and negatives. On the more challenging side of things, uh, as we've documented over the last several years in our report on the open source, or open source reporting on global counter space capabilities, we have seen a proliferation of counter space capabilities and uh, satellite weapons that are being developed by a growing number of countries around the world. And not just developed, but we've also seen destructive testing take place by four different countries over the last 15 years. And we've seen a growing uh, number of examples of these uh, counter space capabilities being used in armed conflicts around the world. All of those signal that this is a growing topic of importance one that needs to be dealt with uh, and, and one that is really, I think, worrying for the future of space security, sustainability, and stability. On the positive side of things, we have also seen a growing number of countries that have been uh, interested or focused on coming up with solutions to improve the situation, um, exploring not only uh, what the threats are, but also looking at how to address them and how to reduce the risk that these threats pose. Um, and I think it's worth uh, taking a minute to contemplate just how different that conversation has become over the last couple of years as to where it has been over the last few decades. Um, from my perspective, of course, the, the United Nations has been talking about the issue of of counter space and satellite weapons under the issue of Peros for decades. Um, unfortunately, I think in the past that conversation has all too often been focused mostly on the, the large space powers. And, and what we've seen over the last few years is a growing number of other countries that are having their voices, their perspectives heard uh, and are, are taking an interest in the issue and developing national positions so they can engage more thoroughly in the uh, multilateral discussion. So to me, that is a, a positive sign. I think it's also a positive sign that the uh, conversation recently on space security issues uh, has shifted from more of the theoretical questions to more of how do we deal with uh, some of the real world challenges that I mentioned earlier. And again, I think that is a positive uh, development. Of course, we still have quite a ways to go, and I'm more than happy in, in the discussion that follows to talk about, you know, what some of the remaining challenges are, where we need to go. Um, but I will stop there as far as my opening remarks and pass it back to the moderator. 
Thank you. Thank you, Brian, for your remarks. I especially like how you focus on the positive as well and really showcase that the conversation has progressed and has evolved since the beginning of Peros, and especially that there are a growing number of um, emerging space actors and in general states that are sharing their perspectives. I think it's important to focus on that positive. Um, and now if I could pass to Andre, if you don't mind sharing with us your, your general views on this. So let me start first with uh, some basics. Um, uh, uh, the name of our conference is Space Security, but we see that uh, uh, that some ex experts uh, uh, confuse uh, about the meaning of this uh, term uh, uh, security, especially in the, in the context of space. Uh, many experts mix, mix it up with the uh, term safety. The first term should be considered in the context of presence of uh, military threats and, and dangers in outer space. And as to uh, safety, this term is more applicable to dangers and hazards that arise due to peaceful uh, exploration and exploitation of outer space. It mostly relates to traffic management uh, of civilian as well as military uh, satellites and sustainability of peaceful space activities. These fields are subjects of uh, consideration in COPIUS, not obviously inside UN disarmament machinery. So these two terms, security and safety, in outer space are completely different. There might be only one striking uh, interrelation between them. When security uh, drastically declines and armed conflict starts in space, Maintaining, uh, maintaining safety of space systems and sustainability of space activity uh, will be very pro problematic, if possible, at all. It will, it will not make any difference whether parties of this armed conflict respect uh, IHL or not, because uh, others, uh, uh, civilian uh, assets will suffer a lot. Uh, and uh, some basics also uh, regarding differences between, item, uh, between terms uh, threat and dangers or risks. Uh, to our mind, uh, danger is a state of affairs that can lead to creation of threats under certain conditions. If we can control or manage these conditions, we can prevent evolution of danger into uh, a real threat. Threat, in turn, uh, in its turn, means a state uh, uh, of affair where there is capabilities and intentions to inflict damage. This, this is a, uh, very important to fix uh, this understanding because some states too often use their perception of threats for justification of building up counter space capabilities, which in its turn can generate direct existential threats for other participants of the space activities. Uh, this is uh, also very important to understand that uh, magnitude of uh, military threats in space should be assessed only by examining uh, respective military capabilities, but not by intentions or behaviors. Intentions uh, can often be changed and behaviors are always subjective. To be more specific, uh, in Russia we consider the current situation as dangerous when a small number of countries and regional organizations have approved, approved mil military space policies with the designation of outer space as another war fighting domain in which counter space operations can be con conducted. Let alone US doctrinal documents that are setting the task of ensuring military dominance or supremacy in space. This can involve inter-real threats. Uh, for us, it's very dangerous that Washington and its allies uh, are pursuing a course of building up potential to project force in, from, and against space, both kinetic and non-kinetic. A lot of large-scale military programs are underway. The most troubling one is the Space Shuttle X-37B, which has counter-space potential. Moreover, it is operated by uh, U.S. Navy Sp uh, Space Delta IX unit, which is responsible for defeating orbital threats. We are particularly worried about uh, current U.S. Uh, intentions to re reincarnate uh, the uh, SDI program, uh, so-called Star Wars program. In this May, U.S. President approved the transfer of missile defense functions from the Strategic Command to, to the U.S. Space Command. 
this can have very negative uh, uh, replication for space uh, security. We also consider uh, the use of civilian space infrastructure and assets for military pur purposes as a very dangerous practice jeopardizing space security. It makes these satellite uh, legitimate targets in case of military confrontation and armed conflict. So against this back backdrop, we have to admit that there, there are gaps in the current space law, including uh, uh, open space treaty uh, that allow some states to strengthen their space security at the expense of security of other. That's why there is a, a immediate pressing necess necessity to close those gaps and to pro prohibit uh, placement of any types of weapons in outer space by a multilateral legally binding instrument on Paris. And a good basis for this is the draft uh, PPWT proposed by uh, uh, Russia and China. And uh, it should be obvious for everyone that the more intense arms race uh, uh, we have in outer space, the more military danger and threats uh, will be created here, and the less security and safety uh, there will be for peaceful space activities. Thank you so much. Looking forward for questions. Thank you for your general views. And you, you talk a lot about that complex you know, relationship between safety, security, kind of sustainability, um, and to not shamelessly plug, but you know, we have done a report recently that really addresses this issue, because as you mentioned, there is such a you know, versatility when it comes to the use of those terms. And so it is important that we try and be on the same page, or at least that we continue to have events and spaces like this to where we can share those perspectives about what is a pressing issue for security, um, and how we can and make sure to, to keep that conversation kind of contained and progressed in, in a direct manner. Um, and, and also for, for sharing some more of the, the concrete threats and, and perspectives um, from, from the Russian perspective. And so um, now, if we don't mind, we'll pass to, to Rania for your general views. Um, thank you. Good morning. What I understood so far from this conference and from the previous ones is that First of all, in order to start this conversation, we need first to have a common understanding of what is security and safety in space. So now we have more countries involved. We have countries that have been producers becoming um, consumers, becoming producers. We have more African countries as well involved. And this is actually something good for the space industry, but also at the same time, it's something that is going to create some issues in terms of space, the new generation of space systems and the new policies that should be involved as well. The thing is that we currently have thousands of satellites in orbit. And I guess by next decade, it will be around 20,000 satellites. Technically speaking, the huge number of satellites is going to raise the probability of having collisions and of having debris. So that's the first thing probably we need to think about it even before talking about weaponization and military uses of space systems. This thing actually needs a lot of thinking on the way we need to create our space systems, on the size of systems, CubeSats, mega constellations, the size and number of satellites that should be in a constellation, and also the, the uses of the satellite itself. In my opinion, the dual use of a satellite is something that is becoming a major topic to everyone. And it's something we need to consider because it's very useful. And at the same time, it's very risky for many countries or everyone. So let's say that this is something that we need, first of all, to think about it technically on the system level first and also on the policy wise. Because taking a decision to create such a satellite can be problematic for the satellite, for the environment let's say, for, for the entire orbit in general. So here we talk more about what kind of satellites we need to use. We need to talk about what is the supply chain in general, because when we talk about cyber threats or space threats, we don't only talk about this, the threats that would be in satellite itself, but we talk about the chain in general. The chain involves the ground stations, the link, and the satellite or the vehicle that we have. And here I insist on saying spacecraft or vehicle because not only the satellites that have threats, but also stations. So you need also to know that the, even the International Space Station has some issues before, and I guess the, the future ones as well. So that's why we consider, before making any kind of project in all levels, creating a document called the Risk 
assessment document. This document is listing the, all the potential scenarios we have. Technically speaking, as engineer, I would say this is the most important document to create a project. For our case, it's not really an entire fully document we have, because unfortunately we still ignore all the risks that will become there. And here for this risk assessment, we need to consider first, first on, the, on the hardware side, which, which means on the system side, how a system can, can be, uh, let's say, managed, monitored, but on, on certain threats. We have to consider what kind of protocols we need to use in order to avoid any kind of threats as well. And we need also to understand what are the ones that we cannot control. And by here, I would say, for example, the micro debris that we, we ignore sometimes can become in very not, I mean, it can be even make the space station uh, not work for several months. The satellite uh, also having disruptions for several months. This is something we need to consider. The radiation as well, um, the not proper use of certain spacecrafts is, is also extremely dangerous. And of course here, um, since I'm African, I insist on the use, on the say, the fact of saying that African countries also need to be involved more on this. So, um, and here we, we don't, we do not want only few countries taking decisions and making this kind of, of uh, let's say, um, assessments, but also we need to have everyone involved in that because this is something that concerns all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rania, for, for sharing your, your general views. And I think it's also important, because um, as we're talking about terms and, and terminology, uh, to, to highlight the differences in sectors as well of maybe dip diplomatic and political communities and the technical communities and how these terms are being used and how we can make sure to keep having these kind of cross-sector um, cross events so that way we can create more informed policy and more effective policy. Uh, so I, I appreciate you also pointing out, you know, the space systems as well, about the, the ground components as well as the space segments, and that we're not just talking about satellites here. And of course, highlighting really the need for emerging um, space actors and for the perspectives of different regions and how important that is to, again, make effective and long-term policy because space, uh, as we know, we need to protect it for future generations of all around the globe. So thank you for sharing your general remarks. And if I can now uh, hand over the floor to Joanne for yours, please. Thank you very much, Sarah. It's a pleasure to be here, everybody, um, as it always is. Thank you very much for the organization. I've been thinking about how we deal with space security and the issue of space sustainability and the governance of both from very different perspectives recently, um, seeking to take a very much holistic approach and to echo what Rania just said, a very inclusive international approach um, and from different perspectives. So please allow me to talk about one perspective today and start with a quote from an eminent social biologist, in fact, and Pulitzer Prize winner, Edward Wilson. He said that Darwin's dice have rolled badly for Earth. Our species retains hereditary traits that add greatly to our destructive impact. We are tribal and aggressive, territorial and intent on private space beyond minimal requirements and orientated by selfish drives. Cooperation beyond family and tribal levels comes hard and a sense of global responsibility will come too late. Their genes, as he goes on, predisposes them to plan ahead for most one or two generations and underestimate both the likelihood and impact of disasters. But he goes on to say, and I agree, that rules are changing. And I take also a, an optimistic view. The proliferation of global crises and global issues are now within our lifespan. A greater appreciation of our impact on the world around us and space helped by media is, is now with us. Contracting timescales due to the exponential growth in human population and the growth in technologies, both good and bad, and how we use them and how they can negatively affect our life and our world. And applying this to the space domain, there is now visible and media publicized surveillance and security risks that yes, that worry us. And the perception of being surveyed and monitored, the growing recognition of the damage and destruction we've caused on our planet and now in space, and some of which is not remediable. And a greater understanding of the consequences of aggressive territorial behavior in space, but also very importantly, the value to space, the value of space to us on Earth on a daily basis. Now our job should be easier in space than it is on Earth. There's no biological homeostat 
that we need to research and complicatedly work out. But our aggressive territorial behaviour has already taken precedence over some considered cooperation. For example, states have registered 1, 1 million, sorry, 1.7 million non-geostationary satellites down the road at the ITU, which may be launched into orbit by 2030, 1.7 million. And according to AXA, the insurance underwriter, there were 7,000 active satellites in orbit last year, 6,100 in LEO, 63 were insured, 63 out of 6,100. Some believe that we've already passed the point of exceeding orbital carrying capacity in space. And I've experienced in the last two years alone aggressive tactics and concepts of lawfare to obtain scarce radio frequency spectrum, this form of non-kinetic warfare, which has resulted in, in one jurisdiction alone, 36 cases. I've also experienced the tracking of frequency transmissions, the blocking of satellite signals from the ground, and aggressive physical security risks at Earth stations. Regulators need to undertake responsible due diligence and, and also they need the capacity and the support and the capabilities to do so. And we need to take a holistic view of the threats to space and our space activities and how to manage them. We need to consider all these threats, kinetic threats, cyber threats, ground-based activities. The security and stable, stability of space and the protection of its environment is vital to the security, stability and environment protection of the Earth. So the challenge is how to deal with these threats, and as discussed earlier, there's no panacea as such, but I'm optimistic. And the first thing is a very simple thing, but sometimes hard to put in, in action. Number one, transparency. We need to increase transparency, predictability, and security of all space systems and space activities. And yes, these concepts are often spoken about, but we need concrete and defined measures. And this is going to be increasingly important with complex multi-jurisdictional missions, such as rendezvous and proximity missions, to ensure that the removal of space debris is considered appropriately and not as a threat. As Andre mentioned, we need to manage this subjective perception of threats. We also need to establish what we mean by responsible behaviour in space, which will itself increase transparency and predictability. And as Andre and Rani have both said, we're not very good at using consistent language when discussing space matters. Now, through the Earth and Space Sustainability Initiative, we're collating as many space sustainability standards, space security standards, norms and principles as we can. We're now over 1,700. There are five separate definitions of satellite. So consistent language between these standards is hard and trying to establish consistent language is a serious challenge. But the use of language will simply help reduce misunderstandings and miscalculations. And this is probably one of the greatest steps that all of us in this room as a community can make. Thirdly, cooperative projects. Trust and confidence are best established through collaboration. In fact, with the dawn of large constellations, the need for communication and coordination between states is more important than ever. And fourthly, practical and tangible solutions. Now, what we've been looking at through the Earth and Space Sustainability Initiative is to develop and draft space sustainability security principles that can be formed into standards, recognising what exists, recognising the gaps, and recognising how practically we should fill them and if we need to fill them. Also recognise the importance of civil society, the commercial industry, and finance and insurance and how licensing authorities deal with these issues on due diligence and the incentives that can be used for licensing. We also need to look at these incentives in more detail, dealing with aggressively territorial behaviour. For example, a tiered approach to liability and insurance to, to encourage sustainable and security behaviour. New insurance models that uh, we're looking at a mutual model or a collective model, again, linked to space sustainability, space security. Having targets for removal of space debris, which also stimulates the ADR and RPO market. Sustainability criteria 
and uh, security criteria linked to licensing, launch licensing, orbital licensing and market access across the world. And again, due diligence from responsible regulators and compliance with criteria linked to finance and linked to um, the availability of insurance. When I speak to underwriters, they believe that there is three to four years before Leo is uninsurable. And we're seeking to incentivise, therefore, a race to the top in regard to regulations, standards and compliance with these goals. Access to data is also absolutely key. We need to understand the space environment before we can make assessments or determine actions and responsibilities. Encouraging the sharing of data is key, as is the registration of the objects. And anal analogous to what Edward Wilson also used to write about, he catalogued and helped catalog living objects in the world and threats to them. And only after this work was done could we truly begin to understand the world ecosystem on a holistic level. By leading by example, I work with the UK government on a large public consultation that will be coming out imminently. And it's seeking to take a practical and tangible and measurable um, view and concepts, taking a multilateral approach rather than simply just narratives. So, yes, humans can be destructive. Humans can be aggressively territorial and intent in private space beyond minimal requirements. But we're learning how to collaborate and the value of that for all of us on Earth. And through incentives, including incentive collaboration and understanding the impact of our actions on each other and the environment and security, we can incentivize responsible behavior and understand what that means and help through finance, insurance, licensing, market access, and taking an inclusive approach to all perceptions, including social and cultural. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Joanne, for your, your general views. Um, a lot of interesting as well statistics that you bring up from, you know, from AXA, from insurance perspectives, um, but also from ITU. And it it's really reminds us that we should be looking at across all sectors because um, in which areas can we find solutions? Probably all of them and all of those ideas can contribute to um, maybe faster, but especially more, more tangible solutions as you're talking about. And you, you also bring up this aggressive territorial behavior, which unfortunately we don't want to see proliferate into space, um, right? You're talking about these subjective threats. And so, uh, yeah, very interesting um, um, analogies that you provide. And so as we're going into this question and, and answer section now, I, I want to follow up with you on, on, on some of this. And uh, because what you talk about also really sounds like this bottom up approach as well. And so if I can get your thoughts on on how we can maybe per pursue a bottom up approach, what what do you think of this for space security? And as you're mentioning some of the sectors, but which which sectors maybe can we really look for as a way to um, you know, to, to build space security. And is this something that, you know, if we expand it from the diplomatic community into these areas as well, can we have stepping stones from these different sectors that contribute to, to space security governance discussions overall? So if you can just kind of give your, your thoughts on that. I think that's a very interesting question, Sarah, actually. And um, looking at the Earth and Space Sustainability Initiative, we're wanting absolutely to take different perceptions. And as Andre said, a lot of the threats are perceived, but a lot of threats are real. So some of the sectors we're looking at are the energy sector, oil and gas, but also nuclear energy. And there's a lot of similarities between the use of nuclear um, terrestrially but, um, and in generally and how it's regulated compared to space. So actually look at concepts that are coming from the energy and nuclear sector. Um, yes, concepts are also coming from aspects of um, the, the uh, biological sector, the medicine sector, etc. That sounds like a strange analogy, but actually it's important as to how we learn to collaborate and important as to how initially these aspects and threats were established as to human life and mankind. Uh, but also what we're doing is actually, we're not aware that this has been done in such a, a constructive way. Try to actually listen to, I think Rania mentioned, sub-Saharan African countries. Um, New Zealand, Australia, Global South, but also different other indigenous peoples and how they look at space, how they protect space, 
how they use space culturally and social, economically, etc. Because actually, there is no panacea to deal with the space sustainability and security domain. But we need to take, as mentioned in the in the opening session by Guy Ryder, we need to take a holistic approach to this and manage different perspectives. And then very concretely, I'm afraid at the end of the day, money talks. So uh, the aspect of financing these different activities is vital. And finance comes with insurance. And when you, there are six, I think it's now eight, underwriters have left the space market because it's very hard to establish uh, threats, uh, damage, and risk. And the more insurance leave, the harder it is to manage and the harder it is to raise finance in a, a structured way. So coming up with different models and clarity of data, clarity of risks is vital in regard to the finance and insurance. The next aspect too is market access. Large constellation operators need market access across the world. Therefore, every country and regulator has some power here as to how to deal with space sustainability and security because you will be regulating constellations. And you need to consider how you will regulate these constellations in a responsible way and what does responsible mean. So there's a lot of different aspects I think we now need to be taking into account internationally and across sectors and across disciplines. So I think your question is excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for answering it. And uh, again, it just... Um you know, brings us to this brainstorming of the more sectors that are working on this issue, the more language and ideas we also have to borrow on. So from that insurance perspective, for me, it seems extremely interesting and in how to, they would craft, you know, the language and the boundaries of insurance and, and what we can do and work with, with the language. And so supporting these, these sectors, I think, is important and also including ourselves and, and uh, trying to invite and have that cross-collaboration. Um, but a lot has also been said about um, taking more theoretical, you know, frameworks and and, and threats and how we can, you know, actualize on this and, and work on this. And so some, sometimes uh, within our, our conversations, space threats are categorized into, you know, technical vectors of you know, space to space, earth to space, space to earth, and earth to earth. And I uh, pose this question maybe to Andre and, and Brian um, on online of maybe how does such framing, and Ronnie, of course, if you want to uh, pitch in, um, but how does such framing maybe help the conversation of space security? How does, uh, you know, categorizing in this framework uh, way of thinking help or progress the conversation or not? Um, and do you see additional technical parameters that, that could help progress the conversation more or provide a, a better framework of understanding or additional? So um, if we, maybe if, uh, Andre, you would like to, to start with this. Thank you for this question. I think uh, I have to repeat myself that, first of all, we have to separate uh, military threats from uh, uh, dangerous and hazards uh, that arise from uh, peaceful exploration of space, first of all. And I think that uh, 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 this uh, um, framework uh, has covered almost all, uh, all the aspects. Probably I can propose also uh, kinetic and non-kinetic, and uh, harmful one and, uh, and uh, unharmful interf interference. Uh, as to non-kinetic, uh, we have to understand that uh, there are uh, a lot of possibility to interfere. Um, you can use uh, directed energy or uh, electromagnetic spectrum to interfere with the work of satellites. So it's kind of. Uh, I don't think that we can promote uh, discussion uh, uh, on uh, on this framework without understanding for what reason we are doing so. If we are doing uh, so for uh, uh, prohib pro prohibiting of uh, weapons in outer space, it's one thing. But if we are doing so for just describing all the hazards and risks uh, in outer space, I think that uh, it is more complicated. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And and you bring up a good point of how do the theoretical frameworks, you know, it's it's not just a way to describe what is happening, but maybe then we can um, take action steps of, you know, smaller technical agreements that are based off of, of these frameworks, then the smaller chunks or bite-sized pieces may be something that can garner more political will and have um, some, you know, rather than having this 
entire of you know consensus of terms that that can be hard to reach to this the smaller that we can and start and look at things maybe that's a, it's a way to to progress um if we have brian i i tend to agree with uh, uh my russian colleague on this um while it is certainly a very interesting intellectual exercise to go through and categorize and, and just and, and try to classify all of these different types of of threats and activities and, and of course there's you know many of us that that have done that on the back end I, i'm not sure that is a, a a useful exercise for actually making progress on tackling some of these issues and that's in part because we've had a lot of these discussions over the last few decades and i'm not sure what excuse me i'm not sure what new we can add at this point and you know of course you know for, for those parties that are not interested in making progress they can always fall back on this issue of let's rehash the definitions or let's focus on this little minutiae difference between these two things to to delay and to extend for me it comes down to what is it that we truly want to get at um, and, and i think the comment you just made about uh, having some more narrowly focused discussions, to me, I think that makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> I think we need to have, you know, hear from the uh, from the, 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 the stakeholders in the system what the highest priority issues are. And then around those issues, I think we can build a consensus towards uh, a set of definitions on those smaller uh, examples. And then once we have those definitions, then I think it's uh, it's a, we have more ability to come to political agreement consensus um, and also develop things like verification frameworks uh, that could reinforce uh, any agreement. So so that's I think where we are these as a, to today. You know, again, this is not a new problem. This is not a new topic. We've been talking about uh, Peros. We've been talking about security issues for multiple decades. Uh, I think we're at the point now where we need to have a, some political decisions on what the most important issues are um, and then start narrowing our focus on some of those to define precise definitions and then move towards political agreements. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, for, for your answer to that. And I, I do agree that um, it would be it would be fantastic to have some political decision on high priorities. And so um, that's where I appreciate my job to sit on the sidelines of, of uh, how this unfolds. So hopefully we will see those come soon um, and that we're helping facilitate that at this moment. Um, but I want to ask Rania too to follow up on that um, from more of a technical perspective. Um, what do you think about maybe some of these categorizations of these vectors and if um, how do you think it contributes um, to the conversation or could be added to? Thank you so much. This is a fantastic question actually. And I actually like what Brian mentioned. We really do need to know what we need from this. So the first thing, we need to, we need to understand what are our goals. First of all, we need to protect our assets. And the second thing, we need to, to have a sustainable growth in the outer space. And for these two things, we need to know exactly what are the threats. In order to understand what are the threats, the segmentation is essential. So we cannot understand, identify a threat if we do not make a clear segmentation of it, which means we need to understand in which part we are, either we are in the outer space, on the link part, communication part, or in the ground part. Because even if you talk about the ground station, there is several ways of, of, of threats, several categories of threats. And there is several manners of also intruding or also attacking a ground station. For this, we are probably discussing this few, since decades, but in, in my opinion, we do not have enough practices because we are still having issues and threats. And in my opinion, this is very dynamic because we are not probably having conventional satellites, maybe in a few years, we will have quantum satellites and we have other kind of satellites. So all what we have and what we are having as well, it's, it's evolving in a very fast way. In, in a way, we need really to make it sustainable, to make it more dynamic. And for this, I insist on the way we have really to start practicing this. We have to practice how to protect assets. We have to practice how to create a system that is, um, either it's a CubeSat or it's a satellite, um, a, a big one, or it's a space station. We need to understand exactly how to protect it from threats. 
And again, I insist on the fact that making these discussions only to understand the goals is probably not the proper way, but making these discuss discussions to understand what are exactly the threats and what's growing and what's the, the main major issue we have in order to have repeated cyber threats and space threats, it's, it's the, the topic. We need to have a, a clear uh, technical database in order to know exactly what are the threats through this segmentation. Thank you so much for, for bringing that perspective and again for highlighting um, that, yes, we do need to come to this consensus and prioritizing what the, the threats that um, that should be discussed, you know, first and how then we can can really tackle that. Uh, and but you also mentioned, you know, this more of emerging um, technology and the generation of, of, of satellites to come. And so it does bring me to, to a question about how the, the advent of mega constellations, you know, microsats, cubesats, CubeSats, how that uh, affects space security and how these different space systems and objects really fare against the different counter space capabilities. Um, so if perhaps first I, I pass to, to Joanne to, to answer this. Thank you again, Sarah. Again, another very good question. We need to assess the evolving hazards, risks around um, large constellations. Um, and I've had to get my head around in the last couple of years again, a large constellation with distributed architecture that could be licensed by more than one state, two or three licensed states. How do these regulators ensure effective control and management of the constellation? How do they assess collision risks? How do they assess security risks? manage and monitor space conflict. It is vital then that the, the regulators and licensing entities collaborate uh, and share that information. And much will depend on the relationship of the countries in, in that regard. Um, but it comes down in regard to constellations, I think, to the effective regulatory system, the effective national regulators and how they take account of the tens of thousands of satellites because we need to regulate constellations in a very different way than single geo or leo satellites. We need to look at increased congestion, which requires the active management of tens of thousands of satellites, improved space situational awareness and, and SDA, and data from operators on the ground as well as space-based sensors. Um, we need that communication and cooperation between operators um, and potentially um, to quote, I think it was Aaron Bowley, the right of way rules to avoid a chicken and egg or uh, games of chickens um, being played by international commercial operators as companies seek not to move to preserve fuel, etc., and avoid service interruptions. Um, personally, I would hate to think of a game of chicken in space, but actually that's almost what is happening. Um, now, SpaceX and NASA have recently announced a collaborative agreement to help reduce the risk of collisions, but that's one operator in one country, and both of, both of whom are trying to do the right thing. Some companies may be less transparent than others, and maybe without monitoring requirements from a regulator. And there's no homogenous requirements globally as to how national regulators deal with this. Um, I'm also concerned about how this is managed uh, from a spectrum issue. I've already ma um, mentioned the lawfare experience I had with a large constellation um, and first come first serve principle of the ITU that large amounts of spectrum hoarding by constellations can actually be an exclusionary tactic and can exacerbate equity issues. Um, and some say that LEO is already too congested. I've mentioned um, congestion already, and that uh, orbital carrying capacity is already almost been exhausted. We're in the initial stages of what's called the Kessler syndrome. Um, and this needs to be managed through active debris removal. And of course, fragmentation events aren't confined to their own orbits, they can move. So one event from LEO can affect almost every other LEO operator. Um, and these large constellations clearly stress our existing space situational awareness capacity. So big ask is international collaboration and collaboration more than ever between the operators. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne, for your answer. Um, if we maybe turn to, to Brian, if you had something that you wanted to add about this advent of different types of, of satellites um, and how that affects you know, space security and how they themselves can be affected by, by counter space case capabilities. Sure. And I'll just say, you know, I, I would echo all of Joanne's remarks when it comes to the challenges from the licensing and oversight and all of the safety and sustainability <coughs> concerns that those large constellations pose. 
Uh, but I want to focus specifically on sort of the security aspects of them, because I think it really does change the security dynamic. There's, uh, we, you know, the space community for, for decades now has been struggling with this question of, of what we would call resilience. How do we protect space capabilities against attack? And for much of the last few decades, there's been a tendency to have satellites that are very large, very expensive, extraordinarily capable, but also hard to replace. And I think that that incentivized uh, those looking to uh, attack or go after those satellites towards a specific set of counter space capabilities, namely destructive, uh, especially ground based destructive NSL -like capabilities, uh, direct ascents that we've seen tested several times. The uh, it, the, the the ability to uh, have proliferated large constellations changes all of that calculus because destroying a single satellite or a handful of satellites really doesn't yield a whole lot of military utility. Uh, it, it really undercuts the value or the usefulness of those kinds of destructive and uh, satellite weapons. Uh, and, and I would say, um, as someone who works for an organization that is concerned about space sustainability, I think that is a good thing. Um, that those weapons are are not useful because I think that that undercuts part of the reason for their existence. Now, of course, that does not mean these sat these constellations are completely invulnerable. They are still potentially vulnerable to cyber attacks, electronic warfare attacks, um, and, and that's precisely what we've seen happening. I think the advantage of that, though, for the global community is that a cyber attack or a uh, a downlink jamming electronic warfare attack on a satellite does not have the kind of widespread sustainability environmental concerns that a destructive attack has. They're generally focused in nature, they're generally limited to a certain time and place, um, and they don't result in large amounts of space debris. So, you know, given all of the licensing and, and other sustainability challenges we've, that, that Joanne laid out, um, I think from a security standpoint, large constellations are very much a game changer and I think are, are, are changing the way we talk about some of these issues. Thank you so much, Brian, for adding. I wanted to see if um, Andre or Ronnie, you also want to add to this to this question? And just some words. I don't think that the mega constellations uh, and proliferation of small satellites uh, could uh, change uh, the game because it only uh, this practice only uh, uh, rises the price and the, the stakes of um, armed conflict, because for uh, each move you can find a counter move. I can tell you. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, there was a very funny story about the uh, reaction of uh, Soviet Union. Uh, on uh, uh, SDI initiative, they just proposed to put uh, barrel, barrels loaded with explosive, high explosive and uh, nails. So that's, that's why. But uh, I'm, I'm just <laughs> kidding. But so that's why I don't think that it can change uh, rules of the game. Thanks for the antidote, as well. <laughs> uh, but Rania, do, do you have something that you want to add to this? Um, okay, what I can add on this is that, first of all, Technically speaking, having mega constellations, first of all, is without having a clear management, space traffic management is very dangerous. So now, unfortunately, we still do not have the maturity to talk about a proper policy for mega constellations. Not yet. Probably in the next few years we'll have something that we can use, all of us. But right now we do not know what can happen if we have several satellites, if something will happen to either it's on purpose or not to one of them, what can, what can happen afterwards, what's the impact on the constellation overall. So we for sure know what can happen potentially, but we do not yet have the, the entire consequence on the project, on the, the orbit itself and all the other satellites. For CubeSats as well, it's extremely risky. So CubeSats, once you launch a CubeSat, you do not have access to it. So it's, it's, it, will be, it will stay there and you, you won't have access to it. You, you can't manage it or monitor it if there is any issue or threat on top. So um, it's, it's, I would say it's a very uh, vulnerable core you can, you can attack. So if you want to, to just reach a network, 
And the same also for, for Omega Constellation. If you, you have a vulnerability in uncertain satellites, so of course we can have independent communication and we can track what can happen between satellites, but it's, it's also quite risky if you don't, do not have a robust system and robust communication yet mature enough, I would say. Thank you. Before I open up to the audience, I, I do have one final question because we have um, been hearing a lot about space situational awareness, but also importance of information sharing. And so I, I want to follow up on that um, and, and talk about you know this this reference to need um, for focal point to facilitate information sharing um, and sharing of that space situational awareness data, as well as other information that could contribute to the increase of transparency and fostering of trust among stakeholders, as, as we've been talking about. So uh, my, my question is really how important is space situational awareness to space security? Maybe what are some examples of, of how this data can be used to detect and, and understand threats and risk to space systems? And whether or not, um, what, what kind of information uh, do you believe that stakeholders should exchange in conjunction with um, or separate from just um, space situational awareness or SSA? Um, so if, first, maybe I'll, I'll go to, to Brian if you want to share um, some thoughts on this. Or, and then, or actually, Andre, do you want to start first? This is a very pertinent question and a very actual one. Because you will be very surprised to know that back in uh, 2014, uh, in the Copios, uh, uh, Russia proposed to create such kind of center. Uh, the center uh, is called the Unified Center for Information on Near Earth Space Monitoring under the auspices of the United Nations. At the time, this proposal was refused. Um, because uh, uh, the United States thought that uh, all these information are, uh, uh, informations are is very sensitive, uh, so that's why I think that uh, we can revive this initiative. And uh, if you look at the archive of the copios, you will find this initiative and uh, with a clear description what we what should be shared within this uh, unified center. And among uh, other uh, things that uh, could be shared, we propose to disseminate, uh, uh, immediate disseminate of critical information on any dangerous situation in outer space. So that might be covered also. And uh, why, why it is necessary to create this unified uh, uh, center under UN auspices? Because all the information uh, that uh, uh, that uh, um, uh, uh, should be should be uh, first of all objective, and uh, uh, if one uh, one state uh, uh, has its own uh, space assets for space mon uh, monitoring, uh, uh, these states can create only their own perception of uh, what's going on uh, uh, in, in outer space. That's why we need some kind of unified uh, international body that can assess, estimate, and uh, propose uh, uh, some uh, regulations, some, some, some knowledge about uh, uh, outer space activities. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that, Andre. And if, I think we can pass to, to Brian now. Yeah, uh, this is a, a very important topic. Uh, space situation awareness, as, as the other panelists have, have laid out, is the, the underlying foundation for everything, both on the sustainability side and the security side. And, you know, it's been a longstanding goal of Secure World Foundation to work to increase the sharing of space situation awareness data among all stakeholders because everyone operating in space needs a better understanding of what's happening there. Uh, that said, while the, the engineer in me uh, would very much like to have a single unified system and a single unified catalog and, and all that working out, uh, the, um, uh, the political scientist in me who's been working on some of these challenges for the last 10 to 15 years, I'm not quite sure we're ready to get there yet. And it all comes down to trust. I just don't see that there is the trust between the different countries, uh, both in terms of what to share and and what they might get back uh, to be able to have a single unified system. So I think that that is definitely a goal we should be working towards. But in the meantime, the world we're going to be living in is one where there are going to be multiple stakeholders, and that is both governments as well as uh, commercial entities and some private sector entities like nonprofits 
that are going to have different sets of data, different catalogs and their own capabilities. And the real question to me is how can we develop the standards that are going to allow interchange and exchange between all those different providers? One example you might look about is, is the, uh, the, the internet where there are some core fundamental technologies, uh, TCP IP and other hundreds of technical standards that were developed that allows for all of these different national networks and corporate networks to be connected together to exchange data without there need to be one single unified network that is under the control of an international entity. I, I'm not quite sure all countries would be, would be uh, comfortable with having, not having national control over their, their networks, but having international control. So I think working on those standards that are gonna allow for interoperability and data exchange between all of the existing players, I think that is a really important interim step while we continue to hopefully someday work towards a, a more unified system. Rick, thank you so much, Brian, for the insight and, and talking about that um, standards and, and regulation. I wonder, too, if Joanne, you would like to add um, to this question as well. Just echoing Brian entirely, I think this is a key priority for defense security, but also all of the new um, commercial activities. Um, we need to understand the environment before we can make assessments, before we can determine our actions. Um, and I also agree with Brian as to it comes down to trust. Miscalculations, miscommunications, we can avoid them by sharing data and understanding the environment. Um, make sure that objects, for example, for RPO missions are not confused as, as, as missiles or anything else that is uh, more strategically dangerous. But also because there are new players in, entering into the space domain, multiple different stakeholders, public and private, they're all coming from different perspectives. And therefore, that data and that trust and confidence that is built up to avoid miscalculations and miscommunications is vital. We're also going to see more of this rendezvous and proximity operations missions because we do need to remove uh, what is up there. Now, there's a lot of uh, security and surveillance aspects on this. And again, to make sure that is done uh, in a secure way, in a sustainable way, in a collaborative way, we need that data. Um, and to be able to share it, understand it, and have faith and trust in the data that is there. Thank you. Thank you so much for the uh, perspective, Joanne. And um, I want to turn to, to Ronnie if you want to add something to this question as well. I would say, um, okay, now we, we talk sometimes about certain scenarios in which we talk about the, the safety of citizens and we talk about the safety of the ground infrastructures we have. So this is sometimes quite critical to be, I would say the word forced or obliged to collaborate. And by here, I would say that the hardware we have, like the sensors, the software tools we have, sometimes are not enough. So we, un unfortunately, for certain spacefaring countries, they have evolved a lot in the space security. Others, they still do not manage it too much. But I would agree that on the fact of sharing data and sharing um, this kind of uh, understanding on this kind of technologies will be very useful. A part of that, for certain cases, we have to create a co what we call a hot redundancy between operation centers. Because in my opinion, one operation center and one satellite that is having certain data is not enough. So you need to create this redundancy in order to track and understand at least what's going on and then in order to make further movements. So for this, technically speaking, sharing the, the, the database is essential. So then we can decide at which extent we can do this. Having trust, of course, it's important. I do believe this is happening in Europe. Um, uh, there is a certain um, collaboration in the European uh, countries uh, on this topic and they're doing it great. So this is a very good example we can rely on. So we can do the same for regions, for an international database, for example, and we can just at least start exercising this kind of collaboration between operation centers. Thank you so much. And I, I really like the phrase you use, um, obliged to collaborate, because indeed, um, I think we can all agree that, that we are. But I, I do want to take this moment now to open up the floor to uh, questions from our audience. We're doing well on time, um, so that's always good. So please, for those that are in the room, if you raise your placards or your hands, uh, then we can field those questions. And for those of you that are virtual, um, you can check the chat for directions on how to ask questions, but field those to the Q&A box. My name is Maud. I'm from the Netherlands. 
And I have one question for uh, Mr. Shabalin, but maybe also others can um, uh, yeah, elaborate on my question. Um, it's about the nexus between strategic stability and deterrence in the space domain. Um, do you consider the concept of deterrence to be attached to traditional domains or also in the space domain? And could you share your views on the use of this concept in this domain? Thank you. Yes, thank you for your question. It is a very interesting one, but uh, uh, as uh, as uh, uh, as we see that uh, uh, that uh, so many new domains uh, appear, we uh, need to estimate how they uh, influence uh, this concept of uh, strategic d deterrence. It is still this concept is still pertinent. Uh, and uh, if we see that uh, uh, this uh, uh, the space uh, might be used as a warfare domain, that we have to estimate how this usage uh, can as, uh, can uh, 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 reduce or increase or uh, reduce our our uh, capabilities to uh, uh, to maintain uh, deterrence, of course. And uh, um, I have already mentioned uh, this uh, SDI initiative. It is a very dangerous one because you, you will never predict uh, uh, the response of uh, your, uh, uh, your opponent. So, and, and I think that it was cancelled uh, by, uh, uh, by US administration uh, given the fact that it may not uh, increase U.S. security, but reduce uh, U.N. security. Because when you, uh, uh, at, the, uh, at, the, at the verge of uh, uh, creating and deploying such kind of system, your opponent can strike first. So these, uh, uh, these considerations uh, uh, are under uh, uh, our military review. And I'm from diplomatics field, so that's why it's very difficult to assess all their uh, preparations, all their uh, uh, assessment and estimation. But of course, I can tell you that uh, all uh, all domains are interlinked, and uh, all domains uh, are uh, accounted uh, whether they can influence our strategic deterrence or not. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. And I know that Brian had also raised his hand, wanted to address this question. So we pass the floor to you, Brian. Thank you. I, I just wanted to echo that it is an, indeed an important question. Uh, it's one that's been studied and, and, and discussed for quite a while. Uh, and, and I would say, I would just sort of, one caution is to not think about deterrence in space like we think about deterrence in the nuclear world because they are different domains, but the concepts, the core concepts of deterrence still apply. I just wanted to put a plug in for a, a recent report uh, issued by the RAND uh, Corporation that studied space deterrence. And they examined uh, multiple different models for how that might work, and also uh, did some work on how they think different countries are approaching this issue by looking at how they, they develop both offensive and, and defensive counterface capabilities. So, I would recommend that report for anybody who's interested in this discussion of space deterrence. Thank you, Brian, for, for answering the question and, and adding um, you know, the resource that, that we'd all, that I'm excited to, to read as well. Um, I see, yes, the uh, gentleman from China, please see your question, sir. Uh, thanks, so moderator, for giving me the floor. Uh, I think uh, the discussion uh, this morning are very uh, useful and helpful. And uh, for uh, this panel one, I think we're trying to, you know, map the space threats in a, uh, a comprehensive way. I think that's useful because now we have multi stakeholder uh, stake, uh, stakeholders in in the area of uh, you know outer space and uh, and uh, space security concerns uh, the the welfare of uh, the all humankind and. Uh, uh, I uh, shared the same views with uh, Ms. Rania uh, that uh, we should start from the common understanding of uh, uh, space threats, and uh, uh, and and also uh, uh, Mr. Shabalin also raised the the distinction between the space uh, uh, the space security and safety. I think the, this the discussion 
of the distinction uh, between uh, space uh, uh, security and safety is uh, very useful. And uh, you know, accor according to my understanding, that uh, space security and space safety are two different issues uh, in nature and the uh, in terms of nature and the, uh, the approaches to deal with them should vary accordingly, and uh, we should avoid mixing them up and confusing the primary with the secondary. And if we cannot, you know, prevent arms race in outer space and safeguard peace in outer space, neither space security nor uh, safety will be possible. And uh, one more thing that, uh, you know, the SSOD once uh, has set uh, the, uh, established the uh, perils as the uh, common goal, uh, and also, it is also the common aspira aspiration of the international community to prevent arms, arms race in outer space and to prevent the uh, armed, armed conflict in outer space. And the, with uh, that in mind, I think we should not lose the, 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 the focus when we uh, discuss uh, discussing, uh, uh, you know, on the uh, space threats. I mean, we, the threats uh, uh, related to, uh, directly related to uh, uh, perils should be uh, set as a priority, priority. Uh, and uh, with, uh, uh, you know, uh, having said that, I want to uh, raise a question that's uh, what is the uh, fundamental uh, source of the risk of uh, arms race? in outer space. So my question will go to Mr. Shabali and uh, Brian. Thank you. But maybe we turn to, to Brian first on answering this fundamental risk source for, for Paros. In my opinion, I am not sure the focusing on the weapons in outer space is the right focusing because where we've seen the arms race happening is on weapons developed terrestrially that can be used to attack objects in space. Uh, again, as I mentioned, we have seen four countries over the last 15 years test such weapons by destroying their own satellites. Uh, and there are other countries that may be considering uh, that. Um, there, of course, are things going on in space. Uh, we've seen at least three different countries that have tested uh, rendezvous and cap uh, proximity operations for military activities uh, with some indications that some of those may be uh, developing co-orbital ASAT capabilities, but I think just focusing on in space ignores this huge problem, which is the proliferation of ground-based weapons and the arms race that is happening there. Thank you, Brian, for um, for your answer, and we'll turn to Andre. I want to react first, firstly on uh, Brian's comments. Uh, first of all, regarding a set uh, capabilities, uh, uh, gear, given the refusal of the United States for, for so long to abandon uh, 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 the core idea to putting weapons in outer space, do you really think that other players will uh, sit idle uh, doing nothing and waiting for this threat uh, materialize? Of course not. I can tell you that uh, now for many countries, developing a set capabilities is a uh, assurance of their security. So that's why uh, I think that it was uh, the main reason for us not putting uh, um, uh, this provision uh, regarding banning cassette in uh, PPWT, because uh, when uh, it, it could be possible, but uh, first of all, we have to agree on uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the possibility of banning uh, weapons in our space. Then we can uh, uh, go further and to uh, to to, pro to prohibit uh, asset capabilities. Uh, so that's why uh, I think that it would will be uh, uh, my answer to uh, uh, Brian. And as to uh, Paris, we do believe that uh, the main threat for Paris is this uh, uh, gradual approach. When we start developing, when when we uh, when some countries uh, uh, propose start, uh, starting developing some kind of uh, rules of behavior, it means that they are proposing not just uh, 
uh, rules of behavior in uh, in uh, uh, space exploration, but rules of waging the war in outer space. This is uh, uh, very important. We have to understand that this is. It, it might create a very dangerous situation when uh, there will be no ban on uh, weapons in outer space, but there will be some rules how to wage uh, uh, the war in outer space. Uh, as to uh, this uh, rendezvous operations, close proximity operation, it, uh, all those aspects are related to uh, copious and uh, to, 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 to issue of uh, traffic management and uh, space exploration. And I can tell you, if you look at the uh, copious activities uh, back in uh, 2009, uh, 2019, uh, it managed to adopt uh, uh, guidelines for uh, long-term uh, space sustainability. But if you uh, look at the history, what uh, preceded uh, to this uh, achievement, uh, unfortunately, Copius left behind uh, seven very important guidelines that was not adopted uh, due to refusal uh, of uh, Western countries. But if you look what is inside of those guidelines, you will find out that they, uh, they are very uh, actual right now because they, touch some, uh, uh, they touched some uh, very important issues of uh, not, uh, uh, not creating uh, uh, policy uh, uh, of uh, using space as a warfare domain. Uh, they, they are related to some uh, information sharing about close proximity uh, operations. They relate, related to some uh, policies regarding uh, not using uh, IST technology against uh, uh, ground infrastructure, so on and so forth. You can look. So that's why uh, I think, I believe that all those aspects related to uh, behavior should be, uh, uh, should be transferred to uh, uh, copios. And uh, they should not be discussed uh, 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 inside the UN uh, disarmament machinery. Thank you. Thank you for, for adding to that and some of the insight that's taken place um, within Copius. I, I want to take the, the chance to, to ask one of our online questions that's directed to, to Joanne. Um, so the um, person online, they have said that you, you mentioned some of those terrestrial nuclear technologies, and they're wondering because there is a growing interest um, for nuclear power and propulsion within satellite systems. And their question is, maybe what threats and risks does this pose, if any, and how could how could that be addressed? Thank you, Sarah. So this is uh, threats and risks in regard to use of nuclear power in space. So, um, so this is this has been a long term issue, of course, in copious and other uh, uh, other other domains. But actually, one thing that we're looking at at the moment is actually the use of certain nuclear power in the, the form of isotropic power, um, which quite a few um, companies are really exploring in some details um, and very, very small aspects. Now, isotropic power in some aspects are going to be very clean, potentially sustainable. There's a big uh, comparison of isotropic power compared to space-based solar power, for example. And, and, and uh, security and sustainability aspects of both. But I think actually there is still some research to be done in, in the use of how we use isotropic power sustainably um, meeting security requirements because it is a valid power source that is clean. But I would actually say that um, th there's still a lot of discussions going on even around intellectual property behind them. Um, but I think it's. I think we're going to see whether we like it or not more the, more of the use of isotropic power in space in regard to launch propulsion um, aspects and manufacturing robotics in space, etc. But I would actually say that we need some more international discussions to understand the use, the security aspects, and the sustainability use of it. Thank you so much for for answering that, Joanna. I also see that we have the gentleman from uh, Pakistan that has his placard raised for questions. So I'll turn the floor to you. Thank you so much. 
my question is addressed to any of the panelists who may wish to uh, chip in, and it's um, also borrowed from the earlier discussions that we just had uh, from a question on, on deterrence. Um, I think Brian also mentioned about the study of RAND uh, on deterrence, and we see this increasing now uh, trend of uh, examining how deterrence could be applied in space. We see major spacefaring nation um, using those concepts in their policies, on, in their doctrines, in their practices. Uh, and um, although, uh, as Brian pointed out, that there are, uh, there are differences uh, when we look at the traditional nuclear domain, but we still see same uh, terminologies, uh, whether they're denial uh, or offensive dominant deterrence or escalation, and all those concepts being increasingly streamlined uh, by various actors. So my question is, have we arrived at this point where uh, this inevitable race of capabilities, uh, counter space capabilities in order to pursue deterrence in space, it, 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 it's, uh, it cannot be stopped, uh, and the only ambition that we can have is uh, to develop an exclusive focus on uh, behavior, uh, behavioral approaches, or are there still uh, any scenarios or chances going forward uh, in disarmament machinery to focus on the arms control uh, aspects of deterrence uh, of these capabilities uh, to ensure that uh, it's not just the norms in terms of certain behavioral actions or testing, but there are some limits and constraint in terms of development of those counter space capabilities as well. And this action of holding satellites at risk in pursuit of deterrence, it's, it's something that should not be normalized. So uh, that is a question and that's open to any panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. And I will open the floor to either of our, um, any of our panelists, if they would wish to, to take a stab at the first, you know, at first answering the question. Maybe we'll go to Andre. Thank you for, for question. And uh, uh, I think that uh, we should not, uh, we have to pay attention on, on, on the question of how, of course, but uh, it is more important to understand what uh, we, uh, what can we do? Uh, so I think that we on the verge of uh, uh, working uh, of uh, DGE on Paris, and it is a very important uh, uh, platform to discuss all those issues, I think. And uh, if you look at the mandate of this group, you will find that uh, uh, the, the, the prospects are really bright uh, if there will be, a, of course, political will of uh, participants. So, that, that's, so that's why I think that we have to concentrate all our attention to uh, this uh, DG on Paris. Thank you. Wondering if anyone else from the, the panel wants to, to answer the, the question? So it's, it's a very good question. And I, want, I would just repeat that, uh, you know, deterrence concepts and theories do not change. The question is how do we apply them? And to me, uh, whenever I'm asked about how do I deterrence, I always ask who from what, uh, because there, that really matters when it comes to uh, deterrence. And unfortunately, that term gets used extremely broadly to cover such a wide range of, of things that it almost becomes a, a magical incantation that I am deterring this when when you dig a little bit and, and, and it becomes hard to find out so i i don't i don't think we're going to find a, a universal concept of deterrence uh to the the core of the question which is whether we you know the the window for um whether the window for you know arms control on specific technologies and capabilities has closed uh and, and all we have left to deal with is norms and behaviors. I'm not quite sure that is the way I would frame it uh, because there's an implied in there that that the choices are either arms control that is legally binding or voluntary norms. And I think 
those are not exclusive capabilities. I think you can have legally binding restrictions on activities that are harmful or pose threats to the system and to everyone. Um, and I think that is something that the community might might look to work towards uh, and not just focus on purely voluntary means. Uh, but it's going to require a, a more rigorous discussion of what specifically we're, 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 we're talking about. Thank you so much, Brian, for, for adding to that um, conversation. And I am checking to see if we have, oh, yes, we do. Um, Yes, please, question. Um, Joanne mentioned that there are only 63 satellites that have been insured, and one of the key ways to encourage satellites being deorbited is having this insurance, um, creating a more sustainable environment. Is this anti-satellite technology putting off insurers? And if so, how do countries plan to kind of honestly engage in the issue of space sustainability when their own technology, this anti-satellite technology, is pushing us closer to Kessler syndrome? Thank you so much for the question, Joanne. Do you want to, to take that? I think I missed the last part of your question there, Emma. But um, the first part was, uh, maybe I could ask you just to repeat the second part. The first part was, is the concept of anti-satellite technology um, putting off insurers? Um, most insurance policies actually have exclusions dealing with um, terrorism, uh, warfare, etc. Um, so it's not necessarily putting them off, or put it, but in, as they're doing their due diligence and risk assessments, the risk of the orbital populations, the threats, the technology, et cetera, needs to be classed and taken as a whole uh, holistically. Um, and the issue is at the moment is what do they use to assess the technology and the threats against, which is where this concept of holistic forms of standards is coming from. Um, if we can take a holistic approach to standards that is very practical and closing the gaps in existing standards, and by the way, this is no mean feat. Taking a holistic approach to standards is not, is not easy because you have to agree some form of consensus to get a standard produced, but we're not going to actually change the dial un unless we actually uh, take on these activities. Um, but with these standards, we're hoping that insurers can get comfortable and stay in the market. Um, the other issue why insurers are leaving Leo market is simply, again, money talks. They need to make money in this market. They're commercial operators. They make much more money with the value of much larger satellites in Geo compared to Leo. And the risks compared to the money reward ratio in Leo is, is very limited. And then, forgive me, your second point of the question. So it's kind of you kind of answered it. it was almost um, I was curious about the generation of debris from these anti-satellites um, things putting off insurers because of course it would um, uh, make the risk of damage to their satellites higher. Um, so I was sort of asking how countries plan to talk about space sustainability when they're increasing the risk of Kessler syndrome because they're pushing pushing us towards it with these technologies developing debris. And this also comes to you're making a risk assessment as to the likely risks of a LEO satellite of two to eight years, for example, lifetime. Um, you're then having to try and quantify and model what will be the debris in orbital population, not just the, or the active orbital population, but the um, and also micro debris under 10 centimetres, etc. So this is a real problem for um, particularly third party liability insurers and underwriters. Um, and it's very, very hard to model. So we've seen some of the 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 big insurers, AIG, Space, um, uh, Swiss Re, etc. leaving. Um, because it's so hard to quantify. Um, and with new activities, civil, military, et cetera, um, anti-satellite, this risk is only going one way. So thank you for your question. Thank you so much for the, the question and answer. Um, I want to turn again to our online audience because we have a, a question that's directed to, to Rania, actually. Um, so asking about if you could elaborate on the risk assessment document that you had talked about um, and to what extent we're able to determine uh, the provenance and attribute responsibility for use of, of counter space capabilities, maybe particularly non-kinetic ASATs. So if you could elaborate on that risk assessment document and maybe speak to, to some of these issues. 
Thank you for the question. Um, maybe I'll come back first to a point because it's linked to your question as well. Um, in fact, the determination of um, the, the norms themselves on um, the, the weaponization or on the arms is much easier than determining and assessing the other risks. Because the other risks, some of them, unfortunately, are not there yet because we do not have enough maturity, as I mentioned before. And the second thing is that this risk assessment is linked to many factors. Some of them uh, are linked to what we call the segmentation, so the different parts in the outer space, in the ground station, and the, the communication. And also the others are also linked to the existence of the new satellites coming up, either on the size level, on the constellation level, we'll have like thousands of satellites, or also of having the new technology of satellites. And here I mention again the quantum satellites. And by here, first of all, we do need to understand our systems, the vulnerabilities that are existing there, what makes them um, like a, a, a weak, weak, the weakness core, let's say, of the, the chain itself, and how we can encounter this. For this, um, I come back on the fact that not only the, the satellite is the main focus for us, but also the ground station here. Because the ground station has been seen and foreseen already some years ago as the weakest core point of the entire supply chain, because there will be intrusion of computers and there will be more easier access to it and the data inside. But also the protocols used for communication sometimes are not the wisest decision. And here we talk about probably not the spacefaring countries, but also for others and some other companies that have just started in the space sector. And this should be normalized and checked again uh, with the new technologies existing. And the other thing, Again, I'm talking probably on, from, from private sector, so uh, we are currently launching the next generation of Galileo satellites, more 26 satellites. So Galileo is one of the most accurate and um, important telecommunication satellites we have. And the technology probably we have is, is quite, quite mature and quite good for having a very good telecommunication com network, let's say. But even with this, we are still wondering if it's enough for the next years, because a satellite here, we're not talking about two years, we're talking about five to 10 years, even more. So we don't know what might happen. So for this risk assessment thing, we try to have what I said again, the collaboration between countries, because some have already exercised some areas, others didn't. And for this, uh, understanding the system, understanding the, the tools we have, and understanding the procedures, and by here I'm talking probably about the, the space surveillance tracking, so that is already existing, that is, in my opinion, the backbone of the space traffic management. That is something that we need to give a major focus on. So for this, um, we need to rely a lot on the, the what the operation center is doing right now, what kind of issues they had, what kind of things we need to build on, and how we can have this kind of redundancy in order to have a, an entire the entire picture of, of what's happening up there. And again, um, yeah, probably here we talk about several areas related to uh, weapons, weaponizations, and nuclear weapons, and also what can happen in this space there, but this is... In, it's still um, not, not the only target. It's probably very simple to monitor it, but it's still, um, in my opinion, very minor to what we might have in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for, for answering the question. And I'll take a final um, sweep of the floor to see, oh, yes, uh, gentleman in the back, please. Thank you. Um, you've said that the issue of trust is quite significant, fundamental to the progression of space and safety and security. Could I ask what's been done by the committee, what plan, the committee perhaps plans to do, or the organization plans to do, to try and improve the trust between nations and to focus on improving trust between nations? And so this is maybe a question, a question to all. So um, maybe what mechanisms and how under the, the UN framework, but also outside of, outside of that, uh, can we increase that trust as, as you're talking, talking about? So if, um, then this is probably also a really great question to, to end on for this segment, so I thank you for that. And I can open uh, the floor maybe in the reverse, the reverse order that we had um, gone in first, so starting with, with Brian first. So we're going to end on uh, one of the more difficult questions uh, that, that, that's good to get to. Um, so this really is, I, I, I think, probably the most challenging, but one, also one of the most important things to get at. How do we increase trust? Because unfortunately, it is not just a space question. It is, it is the broader geopolitical issues going on uh, that are that are coming into play and being here. 
for one, I would say, I'll go back to something we had earlier, which is the information available, space situation awareness. I think that is going to be critical to building that trust. Yes, we need trust to do a better, to, to work towards a, a, a more unified global SSA system, but at the same time, providing more SSA data, uh, and by that I mean countries that have this data can make it accessible publicly uh, so that everyone can see and compare between different countries, uh, and also the private sector actors that have access can, can make it more of it publicly available. I think that is, to me, the, the, the first step uh, that is going to help increase transparency that will then help increase trust. Perfect. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, and now we can turn to uh, Andre if you want to. You know, I'm a diplomat, so I'm uh, probably uh, over optimistic. Uh, uh, and I do believe in trust building and I do believe in a dialogue. And uh, to build trust, we need to uh, speak to each other, first of all. And only uh, through dialogue can be, be, uh, can, 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 can be built uh, uh, trust. So that's why uh, for us uh, it is very important to continue uh, internationally, international uh, inclusive discussion on uh, uh, Paris uh, on uh, all aspects of uh, space security. So the only, only, this is the only way to build trust. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Ronnie. Do you want to, to add to this and maybe also some final, final remarks? Okay, so contrary to Andre, I'm, I'm here, I'm an engineer, so I'm very technical. So I would say, um, again, we are obliged to have trust because in certain occasions or certain scenarios, we do need to share the data. And for this, we, we, we don't want to have to reach a point in which we will be at the last minute trying to pass the information where we cannot do anything on the situation. But we need to prevent such cases in a way we start making, uh, I would say, for example, some of regional communications or regional sharing, we can start with first steps, we can make some exercises, certain projects in a way to start at least building certain projects in common. But that's, in my opinion, something we have all to reach at certain extent, and it's, it's a must. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Joanne. I think that's a really good question, a very simple question, but not a very simple way to, to answer it. Uh, I would say, number one, discussion, exchange of information, particularly from commercial operators and new players. Um, there used to be a phrase in an advert on TV in the UK, it's good to talk. It's really good to talk. It's very important to share that information transparently. Secondly, we need a bank of information um, to understand what the environment is just now. Uh, thirdly, collaboration. Uh, it's much easier uh, to get on if you're collaborating with mutual objectives on a project. Um, and that goes with multi, multi-international, multilateral, um, large collaborative projects. Um, and I am very optimistic here, but cautionary optimistic, because I also think we need to incentivize collaboration. Incentivize collaboration by way of standards, rules of the road, defined roles and compliance with them. To agree on standards gives us a, a framework and a level playing field, and standards help incentivize that collaboration and offer transparency. So simple, uh, simple question, but difficult answer, but look forward to more of that collaboration moving forward. Thank you. Thank you so much to, to all of our, our panelists for, for this great first discussion and, and a way to, to open up the rest of the conference. Um, I feel like what we've really been able to, to take away here is that, yes, we do need common understanding across sectors, even within the, the UN framework, and that it's worth exploring that bottom-up approach, and that we made time to move away some from this theoretical conversations and frameworks to more of these concrete um, ideas and steps but by taking that holistic and globally inclusive approach, um, which doesn't mean having just a, a, a wide focus, where, but we can really maybe narrow, narrow that focus on identifying uh, top shared global priorities on space security. So I, I want to thank again all of our, our panelists, our esteemed panelists, for, for joining us for this discussion this morning.